Warning, the Not Real Art Podcast is intended for creative audiences only. The Not Real Art Podcast celebrates creativity and creative culture worldwide. It contains material that is fresh, fun and inspiring and is not suitable for boring old art snobs. Now, let's get started and enjoy the show. Greetings and salutations, my creative brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast, where we celebrate creative culture and the artists who make it. I'm your host, Sourdough. My co-host, the one and only Man One, is on assignment. I think it's safe to say podcasting is hot, but with over 1.6 million podcasts, it's very difficult to get noticed or make any money if you have a podcast, which is why my guest today started his company. Jurgen Brekessel is the founder of Polymash, a boutique digital marketing agency based in Florida. Jurgen's a true polymath. His professional and personal journey is inspiring. He's a professional photographer, computer programmer, app developer, digital marketing expert, and podcaster who immigrated from Germany to the United States. I met Jurgen a few years back when I hired him to help me with my digital marketing of this podcast, and the results have been fantastic. But perhaps the best part is he's just a fantastic human being who's also become a good friend. So if you want to learn about podcasting or digital marketing, or if you have a podcast that you need help with, you need to hear this interview. You need to talk to Jurgen and see if he can help you too, because his company Polymash is fantastic and he's fantastic. And I know you're going to appreciate hearing from him today. But before we get into it, I want to thank you for tuning in to the 110th episode of the Not Real Art Podcast. Be sure to like this episode and subscribe. Your likes and follows helps ensure you won't miss any new shows, and it makes the algorithm gods happy, which helps us. So thanks for that. In other news, March is International Women's Month, and we are going to celebrate in a big way. To help us celebrate and honor the power of women, we've asked artist and friend Aaron Yoshi to take over the podcast for the whole month of March. We're giving Aaron complete creative control of the podcast, and I know it's going to be awesome. Aaron's going to honor some amazing women in the arts and share some incredible stories. So heads up, stay tuned. We're going to celebrate International Women's Month in March with Aaron Yoshi as your fearless host here at the Not Real Art Podcast. Now, like I was saying, when I needed help with marketing and promoting this podcast, I was looking for a results-oriented digital marketing expert that I could also afford. I did some search on the interwebs. Thankfully, I found a company called Polymash and called them and struck up a conversation with the founder, Jurgen Brekessel. And I've been working with Jurgen and his team now for the last couple of years, and the results have been fantastic. So if you want to learn more about digital marketing or if you have a podcast that you need help with, you know, I recommend that you give Jurgen a call and uh, see if he can help you. At the very least, listen to this interview because you're going to hear from Jurgen and learn a lot. And I know you're going to enjoy what he has to say. So let's get into this and hear from the one and only Jurgen Perkessel. Jürgen Perkessel, welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast. Hey, thank you for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Man, it's 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 our honor. I'm so grateful that you took time out of your busy schedule. You're such a busy man. You know, I usually start these interviews uh, lately by asking the very broad, specific question about podcasts, asking our guests, you know, are they a podcast listener? Have they ever been a guest on a podcast? What podcast are they listening to? But if I ask you that question, we may never uh, get <laughs> off of it because, of course, you are a podcasting professional. You work in the industry. Yeah, in a long-winded, uh, you know, the long-winded way, that's where I've landed. But yes, yeah, so the, the answer is yes and yes and yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so much to talk about, so much to cover. You and I actually met through our mutual interest in podcasting, uh, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But we've really hit it off also in our mutual love for art. I no, mean, I because really, no, I, don't, the, I didn't remember the podcasting angle. You know, I just thought we sort of met on like an art, you know, related uh, 
art related no, or no, mutual I found interest you. kind of thing. But that's, yeah, it's true. Yeah, no, I found you online. I was looking for uh, people smarter than me that could help me uh, think through how to promote market our podcast. I did a little thing, maybe you've heard of it. It's called a Google search <laughs> and found your company, Polymash, online. And when I saw your website, I knew instantly that you were your company was the kind of company I needed and was looking for in terms of helping us with our podcast. And then I filled out your form, your contact engagement application uh, on your website. I think we had a call soon after. And once you heard about what we were doing with Not Real Art, you expressed the fact that you had were and are a photographer and have been quite artistic in your life as well, expressing yourself through your photography. Well, there's a the lessons in there for all artists, I guess, you know, because because my journey definitely has been sort of like one of where I've landed in a bunch of different, you know, ways and moved away from and or quote unquote sold out or commercialized or, you know, I've had all these like sort of a checkered career in, in a number of different disciplines. But just thinking about being on your show and being honored to be invited on it, you know, I was sort of thinking back at my early and how I got started and the journey of being an artist, you know, and, and this idea of art purity back in my day when I was first coming up and this idea of selling out or doing anything commercial or doing anything like that. And so to fast forward 20 some years after that and think that I'm like designing funnels and podcasts and like live in this virtual world of this in COVID country now, like, you know, with the on Zoom and virtually engaging with all other people and have a big, strong di digital presence and somewhat conversant in that space, I would have thought you were crazy if you had, you know, if you had told me that a long time ago, there was this built-in resistance. Yeah, yeah. But you're also, you're like a white tiger and a, or, or a unicorn because, you know, most artists don't have, a lot of artists, uh, and I'm stereotyping here, I admit it, and I'm painting with a broad brush because I, but I feel I can because I've known God knows how many artists uh, over my life. But majority of artists have a hard time with the left side of their brain. Like they are, you know, they're very creative, not hugely analytical or what have you. And you have this really amazing balance between both your creative mind and your analytical mind. I don't know where that comes from, honestly. I mean, it's like, you know, the fact that I, you know, I hated math, I hated anything analytical, you know, back when, when I was still in school. And if you had told me that I was a computer programmer and, you know, on Wall Street at one point, you know, like as part of a career path, it's just crazy, you know, like, and I just, I never, I've never really associated that. All I can say is, is that the art and the knowledge and the and the, that sensibility and the visual design aesthetics and, you know, the, it just permeates creativity, really. It's, it goes beyond the visual. It goes, you know, it goes into how you leverage creativity throughout your entire life and what you can apply it to. And when I first started out, I was very skeptical. You know, my parents would, you know, like would, would have been pushing me in a very commercial, very conservative direction. You know, I was still living in Germany growing up there as a kid. And looking back now, it's sort of like, uh, you know, I can see the value of having sort of a creative upbringing or being involved in the arts that has permeated every single role that I've ever had in my checkered sort of a journey, if you will. And I'm, a, I'm not sure whether that's the same for you, but I would think it, you know, like you'd have lots of parallels that way too, because you're so diverse and you're so, you know, you've got so many different talents and interests and your journey too hasn't been straight art for art's sakes, if I would put it away. Yeah, it's a blessing and a curse, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, have, to have such a, an eclectic palette of interests uh, as we do. So born and raised in Germany. Well, we're, uh, you know, in all candor, I have not. I mean, I've, I've taken your rail through Germany. I've never actually had a proper trip to Germany. What part of Germany are you from? Where did you grow up? Oh, sort of like the, the equivalent of the Pittsburgh industrial, you know, downtown. Not hey, the, we have that in common, too, because uh, I grew up in an industrial armpit uh, as well, uh, uh, northwest uh, Indiana, Gary, Indiana. So. And, uh, and it's amazing. Yeah. Like, you know, I go back now and I haven't visited ants or some, some, you know, some family and it's so clean now. Like, you know, back then it was yeah. sort of the coal country, like, you know, it was in central Germany. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there was definitely heavy, heavy industry. And it's all like super green and solar and like, you know, it's, it's very different now, but it's certainly not the Southern Alps or, yeah. or even the Northern coastlines that people typically think of when they think of Germany. So 
Yeah, at least your hometown evolved into the 21st century of sustainable energy. My hometown is still, you know, <laughs> mining iron ore and making steel. But God bless them. They're putting food on people's plates. But how old were you when you picked up a camera? When did you start shooting? Oh, gosh. You know, I think it it was around the time, that time, maybe 16, 17, my uncle uh, was a painter. I mean, I know exactly where sort of the creative branch of my family comes from. And uh, my, uncle, my uncle was actually an artist. And I remember sort of like traveling as a kid. And, you know, whenever we would go to his house, he'd have paper and all these expensive supplies, you know, like things that we wouldn't, you get, you, when you're a kid, you get a crayon, you know, like, or you if get you're lucky. Like that. And he had these mechanical, like oil paint, or like he had everything. Thing, like in a really, really uh, lovely, talented, he passed away a long time ago. But that certainly out of that branch of the family, you know, like the creativity sort of like permeated. And he had, he also had a camera and my dad had one too. But, you know, it didn't really occur to me that I wanted to be a photographer until, you know, I, I had already been here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Journey to Atlanta, Georgia, which was about as much of a culture shock as you could get from downtown Essen near Dusseldorf, you know, <laughs> industrial city, to being sort of like transported into a high school environment of where people were wearing sort of like, you know, debutante dresses and, and khakis and like that was a prep sort of school environment and I was thoroughly unprepared. Plus, I didn't speak a word of English, not one. Seven years of Latin in school. I right? still don't, but uh, yeah, that's incredible. I mean, <laughs> you know, they, they, when I when I think about immigrating to another country and assimilating and learning a second language, I mean, at the end of the day, like that's why I have the utmost respect for immigrants, and that's why I get so angry and pissed off when our country doesn't figure out a a humane and strategic and self serving way to welcome immigrants into the American community because. These are people who are, you know, oftentimes so damn smart and courageous to come to another country and assimilate. And way more conversant than I was at the time, you know, like I was literally, I was, you know, not, not that it was completely useless. I mean, I was, you know, we started to learn, but I know what you mean. This is like, I have nothing but admiration for, you know, in Europe, it's so commonplace to speak six, seven languages. You know, Robin, my yeah. wife speaks like seven <laughs> and it's wow. like, you know, it's, it's, I, by the way, I, I've met Robin I, and, and, and I'll just confess on the podcast. I adore Robin. Robin is such a dynamic human being. And the fact that but I didn't I'm know blessed, that she I didn't know that she spoke seven languages. So while I already held her in high esteem on a, on a pedestal, now I've got to figure out how to how to even elevate her higher because seven languages is incredible. I don't what know a, what where a, those what a brains come from. You know, some people just, you know, acquire and never. I mean, she lived her father was a diplomat she lived in a bunch of different countries like greece sure, you know, but she sure. speaks greek right she you know france england germany she speaks fluent german it's like i just I mean, it's always amazed me that someone can pick up and retain you know over like many many years the ability yeah. to communicate in that way it's just awesome yeah that's great so when you when you started to embrace photography sounds sounds like maybe you were in new york when you really started thinking like oh i'm gonna embrace photography as a creative expression like what was that like for you you know, I think knowing some of your listeners are young up and coming artists, you know, like I think it was a pretty typical struggle that many of us have experienced that wanted to be artists. I mean, I I started, the desire really came in, you know, the University of Georgia had a really strong art program. It, it was really drilled on into us is that, you know, there's no way that you're ever going to be successful. It was a really adversarial <laughs> approach to bringing up artists. And I think it was done with sort of, here's the, here's the, I'll give you a story. Here's the sign that hangs over the dark room at the University of Georgia. Many people would rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. Oof. You know, yeah. so like they, you know, they were pretty, they were pretty tough. I mean, and I think they did it out of love and tough and, love and a, and yeah. a desire, tough love, yeah. right? To, you know, to prepare people, and uh, the programs were insane. I mean, we the entire time that I was getting a photography degree, I never once used a thirty-five millimeter camera, never once used the flash. We had to build and operate and do everything with our own pinhole cameras. Wow. You know, construct them out of like <laughs> DIY, of man. Like, yeah. Yeah. People were doing creative stuff. I mean, they were like doing 360 degree panoramas with like pinholes in like a round hat box with like five or six different pinholes on it and exposing it on a piece of film that was sitting in the middle of that. You know, really beautiful work that came out of it. Yeah. But 
But at the end of the day, when I said, look, look, I want to be a photographer in New York, I want to move to New York, work in some studios, be an assistant, sort of undertake the this desire of taking your passion and and making a living from mm-hmm. it, you know, like that had its hooks into me. And that's how the, the journey to New York started. And I got here never having used the 35 millimeter camera, nor knew, had seen, hadn't used the flash before, <laughs> basically, right? So I was, I felt thoroughly sort of underprepared, you know, we, we, so we, we had calligraphy, we had design, you know, we had graphic, I had a semi-graphic design mm-hmm. and a mm-hmm. semi-photography degree. But you know what I mean? This is like, the surprising parts of our journeys are often the unexpected ways in which we wind up making use of or in which, you know, our education sort of is tangential maybe even to what the needs are. I mean, I could figure out how to, you know, like they knew that I would figure out how to use a camera and a flash at one point in the future, like, or that they would teach me at a studio. But I think that the focus was more on the design aspect of how to think and see visually or how to communicate visually. So, I mean, learning the tools is one thing. Figuring out how to use the tools is another. Getting a job using the tools is another, right? Because right, they, right, would right. you hire someone? Would you hire someone if you were a photo, photo studio that's only ever worked with a pinhole camera? <laughs> I don't think so, right? Right. Well, and uh, certainly not uh, for a paycheck. That's for sure. You could sweep the floors, maybe. Yes, well, which uh, is exactly what I did. <laughs> but right, right. Well, but so, but then, right, uh, you know, in terms of most artist journeys, right? I mean, the whole point is to find your voice within your medium, right? So, you know, whether that's photography or painting or writing or whatever, finding your unique, distinctive point of view and voice in that medium. Take us back to that moment when you, when you really started to feel like, oh, I'm finding my voice now. This is the area that I want to explore and go deep on and play in. Golly, I like, if, I'm, if I'm honest, it didn't happen during the commercial years in in New York being a professional photography. In fact, if anything, I sort of fell out of love with the medium, you know, through the commercial endeavors that we were going. And I mean, it was still sort of the heyday, it was the, the tail end of the heydays of being a photographer in New York City, or should I say, like mid 80s mm-hmm. or so. Like, I mean, some people would argue that that already was happening in the 60s and 70s. But, you know, working for ad agencies and having clients there telling you to do the same thing over in pink, you know, yeah. like whatever. Like you, you go around and you show your portfolio and the response is, is like, oh, yellow shoes. Do you have some red shoes? Because this job is for red shoes. You know, like there's zero transposition of like, hey, this guy's got an eye or he's got some sort of a creative sense, yeah. you know, in this commercial journey. So I worked in this amazing studio with a Berlin a Jewish photographer that had left Germany at the end of World War II and had some images that probably most of your audience would recognize, like the airlift into Germany, like in a Berlin, you know, wartime. Yeah. He was the sole correspondent for the New York Times during amazing. the Second right, World right. War. Amazing, right, right. We've all covering, seen that work. Yes, exactly. Covering that, right? Yeah. So like, you know, there's some really iconic work that I was fortunate enough to like work in the darkroom and do like do prints for exhibitions and like, you know, and that sort of thing. Wow. So on the technical side, that's where my education was sort of cemented and I was exposed to a lot of like large large format cameras. I mean, like these were like 11 by 14 view cameras, huge. And he was doing some really interesting stop motion photography with that. So it was fun. It was inspiring. But the work and the output and, you know, sort of like thinking of yourself as an artist sort of just eluded me during that time. Yeah. And it wasn't until much later when I sort of honed in on like a Zen minimalist and maybe also aerial photography that, uh, you know, I felt like this is sort of a communication minimalism or Zen type photography that, that I gravitate towards, you know, including landscape and things like that. Sure. But you know what? At that time, it was a hobby. I, I had moved on to other things because as the photography era came to an end in New York City and computers started to influence graphic design ag- and agency use that I was caught up right in that transition. So it was difficult to get work as a photographer at that time. And I sort of had to orient elsewhere. And that's when I sold out, quote unquote, right? mm-hmm. and took a job in, took a job as a, you know, as a software developer, as it turned out. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing, you know, like, but that's a hell of a, that's a hell of a left turn, man. I mean, 
it's like, what was it about the uh, programming job that if it was just the money? You're like, you know what? I need the money. This sounds interesting. Like why, why suddenly was programming attractive to you? There was a pragmatism, but there was also a poetry to the pragmatism because this came about, I mean, just, you know, sorry, this we have some time. So I'll tell you this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, came about as a result of a suicide, unfortunately, oh, so of my roommate's brother. Uh-huh. And it's like, so he was uh, schizophrenic and it's like, I won't go into the background, sure, sure, right? of course. But, but it was basically a family tragedy that happened to my roommate's family and they left for France and spent the whole summer in France. And this was around the time that I was eating rice and beans, being a starving photographer and living in somewhere in Brooklyn, working, trying to get studio work or trying to get work in Manhattan. And I knew I didn't want to go into the fashion yeah. photography aspect of it i was looking for maybe architectural or other kinds of look it's very difficult to be an artist when you're sort of struggling with the very foundations and the basics right maslow hierarchy is mm-hmm. like you know it's very difficult to self-actualize or to find your voice when you're struggling to put food on the table yep. and that was certainly the case yep. right so i'm i'm sitting there on a tuesday morning and i'm looking through the papers for photography jobs right and that section is about this big mm-hmm. And I'm looking for, and all I'm seeing is is that data entry. I mean, this these weren't these weren't programmer jobs. I didn't know how to program, but I was a musician. Uh, well, I have always have been a musician, you know, since school. What do you play? And what I instrument? Was, started with guitar and then sort of like explored all sorts of everything else, but became a producer. And so I was working in New York mm-hmm. and in Manhattan. I was working with producing for a number of bands and solo arts and solo singers and so forth. Right and as part of that, I had started to use a tiny little computer you know it wasn't even really a full like what you would think of as a pc i it was a tiny computer and hooked it up to all these instruments and started doing sequencing and you know i was using some software that was still on floppy disk at the time right. so that's just, just dating myself there right so so i had some familiar with computers but all i was seeing in the newspaper in the new york times on tuesdays which was when the all the jobs were being posted all I could see was, you know, computer data entry, computer data entry, and then the two digital assistance jobs. Mm-hmm. So the doorbell rings. I'm in the middle of this, right? The doorbell rings. UPS, three big boxes. I'm like, what the hell is this? I'm looking at it, and it's a compact PC computer system that my brother had left before he committed suicide and had shipped to a sister, my roommate. So Nobody knew this was coming. It was completely out of left field. The family, his family, is in Europe because of the tragedy in their family. And I get these three boxes. I get a fully functioning computer delivered right into my apartment. And I decided to open the boxes, Mm -hmm. maybe Mm -hmm. inappropriate. I hooked it all up. I printed out all the manuals. And it had like Lotus 1, 2, like a spreadsheet program and it had like a Word document program. I printed out all of the help screens and had my bedroom was covered in paper you know, yeah. like, and uh, from a dot matrix printer. Yeah, right? So yeah. I, this stuff like, I started reading that and then I applied for one of those jobs. Interesting. You know, after wow. three weeks, yeah. I knew enough to get into, into that. And at some point, I had an opportunity to work in basement C of Wall Street under the in you know, 16 Wall Street, underneath the gold vault, there is what's <laughs> called the satellite room. And that's where they put us data entry people at the time. And I got a job. They had misplaced a ton of money, like 6 million euros, I mean, $6 million. And I knew that I that there was a way to find it by sort there were mismatches spread around twenty different PCs that were sitting in the basement. And I brashly suggested to them that I would write software to recover that six million dollars. <laughs> no clue what I was doing. I mean, this was like six ballsy months move, after my like friend. A bunch of ballsy move. But it worked. I couldn't believe it worked. And they hired me. And then, you know, so this is how I got You, you were literally into... the $6 million man at that point. <laughs> I was short. We were $300,000 short at the end of like this entire project, you know, like, but, uh, you know, but we were able to recover some of these misplaced bond and coupons. Yeah. So it was amazing. It suddenly I was getting paid money. I could sort of name my own price at the time. Yeah. I guess the temptation of having some steady income after having been eating, you know, after eating rice and beans for a time, sure. you know, like that was part of the, part of the journey. And many years later, then photography became sort of just a pleasurable artistic endeavor where it wasn't at that time, if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know. Do you have, do you have anything that happened to you on your journey that's sort of like adjacent or similar to that? 
because I know you spend time in Alaska, like, you know, you were in ad agencies, you, you've been, you've had such an interesting journey yourself. And Good question. I haven't really thought too much about it. I mean, I, honestly, I just have always followed my curiosities. And if it sounded interesting and cool, I wanted to do it. And I tried to pursue it. Early on in life, I knew that I didn't want a conventional life. I knew that I didn't want to work a corporate job. I knew that I didn't want to work in the in the steel mills like my father did as an electrician. And I grew up 40 miles outside Chicago. I just remember when I would go into, because we used to go in on field trips at school, you know, because Chicago is famous for its museums. One of the things that it's famous for. So we would go into the city. You know, I'd go as a eight, nine, 10, 11 year old kid to these museums. And I just remember the city was electrifying. I just remember being so charged by the energy of the city. It just seemed to teem with adventure and mystery and, and excitement. And man, that's what I wanted. So, so early in, in life, you know, I knew I wanted to live in downtown Chicago. So I, I knew that at 11 years old, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> that's awesome. and so, and, and, and you had a, you had a connection to the arts, even with that, I mean, an association with that. I mean, so like downtown and the arts, was that part of that? Well, my roots are in music. My mom, I come from a very musical family and my mom was, went to music school, studied music in college. So music was a big part of, of my life growing up. Our friends, were also musical. So like, for example, uh, my mom's best friend, her son, who was like my older brother, he was a prodigy pianist. Incredible. So he, when he was five years of my senior, but he was like my older brother. So he would be playing downtown Chicago. He would be playing at Orchestra Hall, or he'd be playing in jazz clubs or some other club. And sometimes, you know, I would sneak in to see him play, or he would sneak me in to see him play. And so I had at 13, 14, 15 years old, I had this taste <laughs> for culture and the arts and being an artist in Chicago. And, you know, it just, it just electrified me. I just knew that the big wide world uh, was, was calling me and I just couldn't wait to get out of high school and go see it. And so for me, it was just, it was just about following the muse, I guess. And the muse was just my, my curiosity and my sense of it, wanderlust and adventure. And am I this way? because I'm creative or am I creative because I'm this way? I mean, at the end of the day, I just had always been a creative guy. I was a student. Mm. I was a good student, but I clearly wasn't a science math uh, genius, <laughs> but I was, <laughs> uh, you know, I was very well-rounded. I, you know, I did well. I graduated with honor student, what have you, but, but our school, my high school, my junior high school had an incredible liberal arts program. We had robust music, robust theater, robust arts. And so I grew up doing school plays and school musicals. I was in the jazz band and the classical, you know, symphonic mm. orchestra. And I was, you know, so these, these experiences growing up till I was 18 were hugely influential in deciding like, I'm a creative human being. I want to go into the arts, but of course, Chicago being an advertising city. And this was of course, pre, pre Silicon Valley. I mean, there was no tech. I mean, at least in my world, you know, the cool job to have if you grew up around Chicago was to work in advertising and if you were a creative person. Uh -huh. So, so I ended up studying graphic design eventually and, and, and so, so on and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you never really, at least for me, I did, I, I didn't know where I was going, but I couldn't wait to get there. <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> you know? So, so did you ever have this sort of like self-imposed expectation to, you know, this purity that some of us in the art community have, or I had back then, right? This, sort of like expectation because, you know, the the programs that I was part of were sort of like the pure fine arts program, yeah. you know, like with people that wanted to be painters, wanted to do some very sort of traditional art thing. And so right. this concept of you know, quote unquote selling out or doing it or applying yourself commercially didn't really, you know, that, that was sort of frowned upon by a, by a segment of the art communities yeah. that, you know, that I grew up in during those times and maybe even also in New York a little bit right the soho art scene that that's when mm -hmm. when i moved mm -hmm. to new york that's where the studio space was that's where people were you know were growing up and in a way it's a terrible self-limiting belief that you put on yourself is to not you know i didn't realize at the time that this creativity that you had that you've used in in advertising that i've some seeming to have leveraged from many roles like from whether that's user experience or whether that you know it's programming or whether it is starting our own agency polymash 10 years ago and app development right we had like 10 apps in the app store looking back i'm just always so appreciative and so amazed by 
how deeply the creative processes that that came out of those early formative years have been able to manifest themselves all along that journey. So, so what I was going to ask you is, is that did you ever have any of that sort of self-limiting belief of where you thought that, you know, it didn't sound like it to me, right? When you said that, like, well, I wanted to be in the art industry. That was the cool job to have, right? I feel like I missed out on a phase of that, of where, yeah. where I thought, you know, oh, this is cool. I'm getting to, I'm getting to do what I want to do and to right. be an artist, you know? My motivate, you know, it's interesting. And I don't know what, why I was this way or how this happened. Well, you know what? I take that back, actually. I do know that, fun fact, I guess, about me, I was a really sick kid from the time I was born till about the time I was 10. I was very sick. I was, I was bedridden a lot, daydreaming because I couldn't go outside and play. I couldn't, you know, there was a lot of things I couldn't do. So laying there sick, I would daydream. You know, I would imagine what I would be doing, you know, if, if I was only feeling better. And I would imagine having these adventures and seeing the world and traveling the world. One of the cool things that my parents did do for, and I don't come from money and working class, blue, you know, blue collar family from the Midwest. But one of the things that my family did do is that we traveled and either it was road trips or, and we got on planes and I was on a plane flying really primarily to Texas to see their family, friends in Texas, flying at five, six, seven years old. And I just remember loving the sense of the feeling that I had knowing that I was going to an airport to get on a plane, to fly somewhere new and different and exotic. And to me, that was just the essence of life and living. I did have these grand plans to have adventures and travel and stuff. And so for me, it was it, was, it wasn't about money or what have you. It was more about a quality of life. Like I just knew what I wanted and what was real compensation for me, what was real currency for me. If the money came, great. If the money didn't come, great. But money really wasn't a motivation. It wasn't like I was like, oh, am I selling out if I make money or not? No, I'm paying myself because I'm taking action and in, in making the choices to live the kind of life I want to live, if that makes sense. I hear you. Well, you've managed to suddenly create that for yourself. I mean, your stint in Alaska must have been, <laughs> like well, a, it must have been such an accomplishment, it, right? In well, that just, I mean, it, just to clarify, it, it was, it was, and a lot of people make this mistake. It wasn't Alaska. It was, it was, it was Canada, Northern Canada, but yes, the decision to drop out of college, well, uh, quit. I saw your blog post on how you killed a moose. So that's like, you know, whether, <laughs> <laughs> whether that was in Alaska or Canada. Like, that's Yeah. It, you well, know. you know, when you're living, we were grizzly atoms. I mean, we were off the grid, uh, 120 miles away from the nearest town uh, with no electricity, no plumbing. And we were we had no communications, no radio, no mail for a year, basically 10 months total cut off from civilization. And so we had to carry guns. We had to hunt for our food. We had to protect ourselves from the bears. You know, and I was 20. And it was one of those opportunities that came up that spoke to me at my core. When I realized I had this opportunity to go live like Grizzly Adams in the middle of the wilderness, <laughs> I couldn't go fast enough. You know, and I knew that it was dangerous, but I didn't care. I knew that if I lived through it, it would define my life uh, in a very positive way. So I hoped and thought, and it has. And so, so yeah, that's just a, an example of the kinds of choices that people need to make for themselves if they want to live an extraordinary life. You got to take risks. You got to take chances. And, you know, and that's what artists do all the time, right? I mean, they, they, they're taking chances. It's a, it's a dangerous life being an artist, trying to make ends meet. And, you know, for those artists who think that they're selling out to make money, I, you know, quite frankly, I don't find any romance in anyone starving. I don't think being a starving artist is a, is a romantic notion at all. It is about paying your rent, paying your bills, having a decent quality of life. No one's talking about getting rich, but having a fair living wage for your time, for your expertise, for your profession is not an unreasonable thing to aspire to. But yet artists have to advocate for themselves. They have to understand what their time is worth. They have to understand that they have real power. They have to understand how to negotiate a little bit. <laughs> I feel like because the tools of creativity have been democratized, because the galleries aren't necessarily the ga only gatekeepers in, in, in anymore, and because of the digital revolution being empowering people to take their artworks directly to their consumers and to their collectors around the world, the playing field has shifted greatly and put the power back in the artist's hands. But the artists have to accept that responsibility to use those tools, right? Yeah, that's, I mean, that is so, I, that's, you basically answered a question I was going to ask, which, which is, where do you see the experience of young and upcoming artists and, you know, their areas of focus or their attitude towards the commercial 
and or the digital or, you know, the, the self-actualization in this like virtual spaces, mm-hmm. you know, like all things that we haven't had to deal with when, when we were coming up. But even in, even in photography, I mean, the advent of the digital camera sort of like bifurcated the entire photography world into, yes. a, oh my God, you know, like, oh my God, this is like ruining everything from that to iPhone to Instagram. Yeah the ubiquitous nature of having the medium be accessible much more widely. I mean, I feel like the photography community sort of split into either half of people were were admiring of the level of work that it brought, it brought up the entire level of everyone doing work. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you're having people in the Himalayas growing up in a small village, posting these amazingly, amazing landscape photos that you get to see and it's like it's just lifted the overall expectations of what visual arts and the media or at least the photography are you know can be can be like and so i think you called it the democratization of the tools uh-huh. i think that's fascinating and uh, and i think you know, i always have viewed it as a positive but there are people that you know say look there's not real photography unless you pull a silver gelatin print that know how to do you know some of these really old process oriented type type of things you know what i mean Yeah, it's such a fascinating conversation. And I see both sides. I mean, I absolutely believe that you need to know the rules, you need to know your history, you need to know the roots of your craft. But I also get that, you know, young people are ambitious and sometimes idealistic, and they want to produce and, and they suddenly have the tools to to be productive, and they go for it. But it's the classic, you know, older generation, younger generation debate, you know, the, yeah, the purity the, debate. The, of it's like, oh, look, it's not real street art unless, right? You know, you feel well, blank, and, or and it's not real yes, graffiti art yes, unless, you yes, know. yes, yes. And the truth of the matter is, from a demand perspective, I mean, sure, supply of so called art has gone through the roof, right? Because now everybody's an artist, everybody's a photographer. So supply yeah. has gone mm-hmm. through the roof. Sure. 80% of it's probably crap. 20% of it's probably good and maybe a couple percentage genius. But the demand for it is still, I would argue, pretty flat. You know, I think the art world has done a very good job of making you and I think that we don't know anything about art. And we've they, and they've done a very good job of training us to think that or, 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 or convincing us to, to forget that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And if you enjoy a piece of art, and, and it makes you feel good to see that every day. And it costs 250 bucks at the local farmer's market uh, because a local artisan has set up a booth. Then, God damn it, buy that art, hang it in your house and enjoy it. It is art and it's legitimate because you love it. And I feel like this notion that there's just a handful of people that understand what art is or can legitimize art is, is a loser for artists. It, it doesn't serve artists. And are the gatekeepers of, you know, that, you know, but those gatekeepers are no longer as relevant as they were before, right? I mean, I think that's what I love about They're not. the quote unquote the digitization or the, the, you know, the democratization in a digital world is, is that, you know, the access to both the tools and the techniques, the monetization ultimately maybe has been democratized and everyone has, has similar access to it. And so whether or not uh, Gallery X or Curator Y you know, deems that this is proper, you know, you name whatever niche of art we're talking about at the moment, that has become sort of irrelevant. And I think that's where your work is so admirable because the the business of art is now something that, you know, is accessible to such a broader community. But there are still skills involved. There are some prerequisites. There are some frameworks. There are some things that you have to deal with, right, in terms of having a website or having a content strategy or having like, you know, all the things that, you know, you and I both having sort of been in agency life, we see those as, um, you know, not not necessarily defining, but as a necessary scaffolding, you know, to, to do, to be able to do what it is that, you know, that you enjoy as an artist. Yeah. Well, and and this is a great actually segue uh, into something that I want us to talk about because, you know, galleries over the years, right, historically, traditionally, conventionally have been the mouthpiece of the artist, have been the promoter, the publicist of the artist. Artists historically, conventionally, traditionally have relied on the galleries to tell their story and promote their work. And certainly the digital revolution, the democratization of these tools have shifted the power balance a bit. And now artists can, can accept responsibility 
responsibility for telling their stories and promoting their work, which is great. And some certainly do it well and better than others. And but so many artists now or whether it's on Instagram or a website or what have you, they're using these tools to help them tell their stories and promote their work. But of course, there is podcasting. Podcasting is also a tool, a digital tool that um, artists are using. Some of them are using it very well. Some of them are not using it very well, but it is a, a powerful way to help tell their stories and promote their work and support one another, spread the wisdom. I and mean, part of the challenge with being an artist is that it's a, it can be a very lonely existence. We think, you know, we work alone in our studios. We think our problems are unique to us. Uh, we don't understand that the artists across town or across the country is having the same exact issue. And maybe they found a better solution if there was more or uh, what I call water cooler moments where colleagues and peers could come around the water cooler to, to shoot the shit and bitch and moan <laughs> about <laughs> the problems that they're having. They might learn like, oh, wait a minute. No, I solved that problem. This is how you do it. Right. And so podcasting is a great way of, of sharing that knowledge and that information sharing. And that's where the reasons that we started our podcast. You know, we wanted to create a water cooler moment for uh, artists and creatives and designers and, and people who love artists, creatives and designers to, you know, learn about our world, learn about our culture, learn about our struggle, learn about what's going on. And, you know, when we started our podcast, literally, you're going to was just buy the microphones and go. I mean, we didn't you know, we didn't study the, the 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 technology really. We didn't study the market. We didn't try to be strategic or what have you. We literally just wanted to experiment. And we wanted to jump, and that's very much part and parcel to my character anyway. Let's just try it. Let's just go. And so we bought the microphones. We started recording, and it was so much fun. <laughs> I mean, it was it, creatively. It was some of the most fun I'd had in a long time because there were no constraints. There were no expectations. It wasn't, you know, we weren't trying to do anything but learn. And we had a lot of fun. And some of my favorite episodes are those first 20 that we recorded that sound like <laughs> crap <you> know, <laughs> now, but they were so pure, right? They were so innocent. And, but eventually we got to a point where we realized, you know, we need to, we need to start being a little more, or we wanted to be a little more strategic and a little more effective. And, and we were spending a lot of time and energy putting into this podcast. So let's honor our efforts and not mitigate our efforts by being silly or unintelligent about how we market or promote what have you. And so I wanted to find a partner that could help us do that. And while I was doing my research, I found your company. I found you. I found Polymash. I found Jurgen Brickessel. And so I reached out to you and you have been so generous with your time. Of course, we pay you for your time as well. But I mean, you have gone above and beyond for us in so many ways to help us really create a content marketing system. We can track, we can measure, we understand the ROI, the ret return on our investment much better now because of the work that, that you and I have done and that you have helped us with. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the podcast today was because I know there are a lot of artists out there who are spending their precious time because you know, nothing is more precious than our time. I mean, to me, to waste time, that is an unforgivable sin. And I feel like sometimes that artists are, are putting a lot of time and energy into their podcast, but they're not getting the most out of it because maybe they're not setting things up properly or they're not, in, you know, really applying, you know, SEO best practices or they're not leveraging their show notes in a, an effective way. And what are some of those common mistakes? I mean, you clearly work with so many podcasters. You have so many clients that you work with. Take us through some of the common mistakes that you see podcasters make that you're able to help them do better and get more out of their podcast. Well, I mean, first of all, let me just say thank you. And, and you know, like working with you in 2020 and before has been to certainly like the highlight, you know, during pretty difficult times, you know, for us. And, you know, it's just a collaboration and it feels like a partnership in, in so many ways. That also goes to say that we're not a podcasting company. We're a digital strategy company. Right. And, uh, you know, podcasting winds up being the vehicle, uh, one of the vehicles for a content strategy to help businesses or to help achieve an objective. And, you know, for many that's business growth, listener growth, or, you know, whatever it might be. And maybe before I get into like, well, here are some of the tips that we, that I would encourage everyone who has already a podcast, you know, like the question that often precedes is like, why, you know, why even have 
a podcast in a visual, essentially, but often as a visual medium in the arts, you know, like, I mean, do musicians notwithstanding, um, you know, but, but in the creative arts, in the creative space, you know, podcasting seems like sort of like an off, like, you know, there, there's a, you know, big, bit of an oxymoron flavor that you get when you first think about it. Photography podcast, I want to see the photos that we're talking about here, right? I think that it's been for us, the impetus was that we had so many clients and people that we were working with before we got into podcasting that realized a, a couple of sort of fundamental must-haves as a solopreneur, an entrepreneur, as someone, you know, again, this is just as true for artists as it would be for any other small business owner or entrepreneur. And this actually is, would be, if, if we were talking about tips or common mistakes, is that Nicholas Carr coined a phrase in the 90s called digital sharecropping. And digital sharecropping meant that if you build your platform, if someone else owns all of the platform for which you're producing content, or you know, you're they're reaping the benefit of your work and your labor. So if the only place that you exist is on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, and you're basically working to make them advertising dollars, you're basically working to drive traffic and provide the content for traffic to get, tra to get attracted to their platforms. So what Nicholas Carr called that digital sharecropping and, you know, you, we, we're, we're, someone else is reaping the benefits of all this content production work that we as, as creatives are, are doing, right? So right, rule number one for a creative is build your own platform, have your own platform. And for me, often that, I mean, we're, you know, we're, that means a website in today's day and date and form, right? From which everything else gets shared and which everything else emanates from. So when you're posting on YouTube, when you're posting on Facebook, when you're posting on Instagram, the home base for where that content comes from, the thing that you want other people to share, the traffic that you're getting in, the ads that you're, you know, that you may or may not be paying for, all should point to that one central asset that you're going to have that you're going in, in control with. So often that's like, a, you know, this is also one of the reasons that we like WordPress rather than Wix or Squarespace or some of the other environments because, you know, they're not portable, but in a WordPress site, I and mean, you're going to argue this point, the digital geeks would maybe find fault with this argument, but but you can move your site if it's a WordPress site from one from one hosting provider to another, no problem. You know, you are in a much truer sense of the word, you are the owner of your own business asset. And that's the central asset that you then promote outward from. So, you know, you, you post a video on YouTube. Well, the thing you're going to share is your blog post about that video with the full story, right? Like you're, you know, you're posting something on YouTube, you put a little teaser context and a link back to your own site, but you're trying to get people to basically visit, acknowledge, engage with you and get a really true flavor of what your platform is about by coming to visit your own website. So I see many podcasters make that, I don't want to call it a mistake. I'm just call it about like, if you're exploring and you just want to get started and you got to, you can have a podcast tomorrow afternoon, but after you do that, and once you do get a little bit of success and you get a little bit of feedback, one of the first endeavors is to actually set up a proper website for it that, you know, that you publish your episodes on where you, where people can subscribe, hopefully by email, Right. I mean, it's like you if you get and we, there's a stat that most podcasters are very precious about, and that is how many people downloaded my episode. And a lot of people focus on that. What are the downloads and all the conversations and their efforts go into that? And we see it a little differently as a, as a digital strategy agency for a number of reasons. So this may be point number two is that a download doesn't equal a listen. Meaning that on in the podcasting world, when you have your phone and you subscribe to a show, I download 50 episodes on my smartphone every day, but I might only listen to one or two, you know, because right. it happens automatically. Right. It's, right. It's feed based, right. right? So these things are downloading in the background. They're going into my pocket and that, you know, gives the people at the other end of it the false impression that, like, well, I, you know, I've had 50 listens. That's actually not true. And now extending that forward even a little bit more, I don't really care whether I get a subscriber on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. I mean, yeah, it's great. 
what I really care about. I, could, I should say I care less about that than when someone comes to my website and signs up on our website to to start engaging with us and to start asking or commenting or, you know, having some form of, I mean, and, and on YouTube and other platforms as well, you know, that engagement is key, but I would gladly trade a thousand anonymous because that, that's the thing, right? If they're, if they're listening on Apple or if they're listening on Spotify, you just don't know who they are, what they're interested in. You get very little intelligence. The podcasting industry standards are still such that, you know, you have very little understanding of who your audience really is and what their preferences are. I mean, you can go by like, well, how many people downloaded episode X versus episode Y. But, um, you know, but ultimately what we value, we, we would trade a thousand anonymous subscribers for a hundred people that sign up on my email list. And so I would encourage both podcasters and artists to really think about where their own central platform is, what that is, what, how, who owns that asset, and who really benefits from the hard work that this, you know, that producing content really is. Yeah, well, thanks for that. I mean, there's there's so much goodness there, and and you know, and I'm sort of smiling because, of course, you know, this is the 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 goodness <laughs> the goodness that you've brought and and the things that you've taught me as we've been working together over the last couple of years. You know, and and I think there's some conventional wisdom out there that thinks that, you know, email is dead or that email is invaluable or that people to hate email. And sure, there are some people that hate email. But the reality, what, what, you're, what you're saying is emails still have value. Get that email. Understand who you're talking to. Engage with an individual versus an anonymous person that maybe not even listen to your podcast, right? Yeah, I mean, the ability and the right that you might earn to communicate with someone out of band, not just on the pod, on pod, the next podcast episode, that they had no influence on what that even is, you know, you, you can start to have a much more meaningful relationship. And, you know, that gets us to something I know that we, we, we talked about that, you know, a little bit earlier, but I mean, a lot of people get into wanting to earn money from podcasting in some way or another in some form or another yeah how do you monetize you know like is there any money in it can i or can i earn money from my podcast and uh you know i just we just launched a new series of blog posts on our own blog if i had to summarize it i would say that ask not how to monetize your podcast ask how your podcast can help monetize your business Yes. In other words, it winds up being something that is so beneficial, whether you're an artist or an entrepreneur, solopreneur, or even a large corporate, right? That having the right guests being on other shows, this entire concept that, you know, we've also been delving into and exploring a little bit of, of this relationship building. You know, you were mentioning a story and I'll have you tell it again, but, but earlier that like, you know, you, you had a guest on your show and, you know, someone who might be influential in the future but, you know, you just had a good time on the podcast and you established that relationship. And you, after an hour of talking to each other, you told me that you felt like, you know, like, wow, I felt a sense of friendship almost. You know, you were close to yes. wanting yes. to call that person a friend, right? So this intimacy is baked into this into this medium, the, the way that our brain functions and processes a voice that's talking to our ear, you know, and the, is is very intimate, personal the getting to know, like, and trust what someone, the starting conversation that you have, I mean, we have a lot of clients that are actually using podcasts to sort of establish relationships and conversations with who might eventually be potential clients, right? Let's say it's a real estate podcast or an investment podcast, or like, you know, there are different use cases for it. But what we, and, and we are with this, we're not teaching, this is just something that happens, you know, but the, the one piece of feedback that always amazes me is, is that, look, our starting conversation with people that have listened, that are just listeners to the podcast, right? So like you have a thousand people that are listening to you and they're, you know, somehow you're providing some value, some experience of where they, you know, where they enjoy what you have to say and they enter a conversation, the first time conversation winds up being like you've known each other for years. They're talking about something that you might have mentioned in an episode, you know, like half a year ago. It's almost like an imbalanced relationship when you, you know, when you finally meet someone who's been listening to your show for a while, you know, this, this sense of having an intimate relationship with someone or feeling like you are friends with them is something that listeners experience too. And that's one of the many, many opportunities, I would say, for podcasters or anyone who's interested in 
leveraging that as a content strategy medium. That doesn't typically happen on a blog. It doesn't happen on a quick phone call, you know, like that repeat exposure being tr- being turned on by ideas and things that you've heard on a show, you know, has been a very, very powerful business driver for most of the clients for whom we produce this that don't just do it for the fun, but that have some purpose behind it. You've hit the nail on the head because, you know, one of the great things that I've enjoyed about having a podcast is that it's given me an excuse to reach out to virtually anyone I want to reach out to. You know, it's (laughs) like, you know, it's like, hey, hey," you know, we want to have you as a guest on our podcast. Most people's egos are sensitive uh, enough that that they're they're easily stroked. And it's an honor, right, to be asked. Everybody wants to be asked to be a guest on a show at some point. And having a podcast gives you an excuse to reach out to basically anyone to say, we'd love to have you on the show. Majority of people are going to be honored to be asked. Majority of people are going to say yes. And so it is a great business development opportunity. If there's some someone that you want to engage with or get to know or build a relationship with, it's a really interesting, you know, dare I say sleight of hand kind of maneuver, right? Because they may or may not uh, understand that you have a grand plan, <laughs> you know, beyond <laughs> well, the actual interview. And what I mean by, you know, if you're an artist, right? If you're an artist and you have a podcast, the way you would apply this is that it's like, wow, I really wish that Mr. XYZ or Mrs. XYZ, prominent collector, collected my art, right? Well, you know, if you have a podcast, why don't you reach out to prominent collector XYZ and invite them onto your podcast and talk to them about their collection and talk to them about how they, you know, how they love art and what they love and so on and so forth. Build that relationship with that collector. And next thing you know, they're going to be buying your work and collecting your work. So it's a very powerful tool, I think, that is, if you're leveraging it cleverly and strategically, the return on the investment could be really exponential. Yeah, this this idea of tangential topic coverage in a way, right? So it's not that, it's not even that you, you know, like, like the example that you gave from an artist inviting a collector or a gallery owner or something like that, right? So you're, you're not going to try to pitch them anything on your show. You're just tangentially discussing the type of art or the new show or the new opening or the new book they've written, you know? So it's, it's something that they love talking about, right? This is, and this is what happened to us is like, you know, as an agency back in 2010 or so running SEO, search engine optimization and driving traffic websites, you know, most people, we had such a hard time trying to get them to write some content for their websites it was like pulling teeth. You couldn't get them to write any articles. And so we started producing, you know, writing for them. And we started providing some blog and SEO driven content for them. And this is how we stumbled across or stumbled upon podcasting as a content strategy, because they all, without exception, loved talking about their stuff, what they do, right? So they don't want to write articles, put them in a room with someone or put them on a phone call with someone or in a Zoom call with someone. And they love, you know, they can have a conversation for a half an hour or so and boom, there's your piece of content. Get the transcript and we wind up. Our speciality is, is that we then turn because we study Google algorithms and, you know, we're an SEO agency. So we, we are up to date or try to keep up to date with the latest trends in search engine and how to get on, how to get found and how to get traffic to your website once you have it. And taking a transcript and just pasting it on the bottom of your show notes won't quite do the trick, but actually thoughtfully doing keyword research ahead of time of what language What turns a phrase are people interested in? What gets Googled the most? You know, like you can apply that to the titling of a piece of content that you write or an episode that you produce. So never mind who you have on the show or what you talk about. This is always beneficial to like jump into a quick SEO tool. And I know you do that now. That's why I'm mentioning it as well. I'm proud of you. You've trained me well. You're awesome, right? So like, you know, you just, because it gives you some insights into your audience, it gives you insights into how to better serve them. Ultimately, you're not doing this only out of a selfish or sort of skeevy marketing reason. Ultimately, you're doing it to be able to deliver more relevant, more meaningful content to and that your audience likes, right? So the analytics and the ability to you know, ability to bake that into the equation and the conversation and the content that you produce is key. That's how podcasting came to be a content strategy that, you know, we still, that still works really well 
for a lot of the clients that we produce shows for and that we create the post-recording SEO optimized show notes for because it winds up being content on their site that then actually really turns the scale in terms of getting more traffic, more visibility, more search engine rank for their site. Yeah. And I mean, one of the metrics that I've been watching now since working with you, because you introduced me to the notion of domain authority, I was not at all aware of this idea uh, about domain authority. And yeah, and so I'm starting a new a new website, a new brand, if you will, notrealart.com. And one of the first questions you asked me was, well, what's your domain authority? And I, I don't know when, what is the a domain at the, what is that? And so you, you showed me how to, uh, you know, what tools to use to, to understand what my domain authority is. I can tell you that my domain authority has grown exponentially over the last 18 months or so, two years since we've been working together. And it's because of these tools and techniques and technologies and best practices that you have been helping me understand. For our listeners who don't understand what domain authority is, please uh, explain. Yeah, just quickly. It's a, it's an industry metric uh, coined by a company called Moz. You know, it's just a very well-known search engine optimization company. But basically, Domain authority is a rank from zero to 100 that ranks your website and how likely it is to produce any content in the top of the search results. So Google has a domain authority of 100. <laughs> <It's> just, you <laughs> know, <laughs> Damn uh, no. <laughs> but universities will typically be in the 60s or 70s, uh, you know, like really, com- really good commercial sites, big brands might be in the 50s and 60s. A blog like yours and mine, you know, should be operating maybe in the 30s. That's a, that's a good. And we can, and any of those, any of those domain authority results would enable you to consistently get content into the page one of the search results. But if you have a brand new, and the, there are two factors that are the most influential. One is age, so you can't do much about it, right? So how old is your website? If you've had it for a long time, you might have a pretty decent domain authority. There are places that you can look it up. I mean, you just go to mars.com. There are different places you can actually look up what your domain authority is. But typically what we see is, is that once it sort of trickles over 10, 15, uh, you can start to get some content if it's well thought out and well researched on page one. And that can have a drastic impact on the tra- on the organic traffic that you get. And organic traffic is important because of something called search intent. So if you can, you know, if, if typically people that have actually just found you as a result of a search are much more likely to engage with you. If you, assuming that, you know, you're, that you can answer and that you're, that what they're landing on is, is something that they searched the end, you know, the answer to, you know, that is a much, much higher engagement level than an ad or anything that you pay for. And there's also a way of measuring how much this is worth because domain authority or not, but the number of key phrases that you wind up in your site winds up ranking for over time, meaning these are the search terms that people can find you for on page one and that you can generate traffic for. You could pay for that by paying for Google ads, but most of the clients that we now have would have to pay three, four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 a month to rank for the phrases that they've now achieved organically through podcasting, through writing other or through producing other kind of content. So where else can you get free advertising and free marketing boost and free traffic to the tune of $3,000 a month? You know, it's, it's difficult to do that. So I think that that's why we love SEO as a long-term sort of a strategy goal. I think it's something that, you know, once you educate yourself on it, you just bake it into what you would otherwise do anyway, right? So if you're going to spend six hours, you know, or five hours, you know, producing a show and working and tinkering on your podcast and doing show notes, or you're writing a blog, or you're producing a very carefully thought out site about your artwork and you write a little bit about it, you might as well, you know, take the extra 10, 15 minutes to try and SEO optimize it and try to make it discoverable for the search engines because it might not have a result tomorrow, but after six months or a year, like, you know, by the time, you know, a year later and you're getting like $30,000 in free search traffic, basically, if you follow, if you follow these guidelines. And that's why, you know, we think it's such a meaningful 
it's such a meaningful way of, of ensuring that A, you have your own platform and B, that you make use of it. Yeah. I, and I, and thanks for all that. I mean, because I've said, you know, I've talked to so many people over the last couple of years since we started our podcast, people now ask me, you know, whether or not they should start a podcast and I'm quick to, uh, you know, throw, <laughs> maybe I'm a, 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 a cold blanket. They're probably sorry that they asked uh, after I get done with them. But, you know, I'm quick to point out to them that, listen, starting a podcast is the easy fun part, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but finding an audience, if you don't already have a following is the greatest challenge because the market is saturated. There are 1.8, by some estimates, 1.8 million podcasts. Yeah, absolutely. People are just saturated. They're overwhelmed. There's, you know, whether it's uh, 1.8 million podcasts or God knows how many shows or films on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon. And, and look at the number of episodes. The episode growth has been like, you know, 60, 70 percent year over year, meaning that, you know, people produce more episodes twice a week. Right. Daily shows. Right. You know, NPR and other places entering the space. But yet, do you know what the, the metric is for listener growth? Metric for a listener. Ooh, I'm on the spot. Pop quiz. Uh, no, Jurgen, <laughs> it's not. It's not dawning on me. Uh, I didn't realize uh, there would be a test today, sir. <laughs> I should have got to, you. Should have said the, <laughs> listener growth is five percent. So you just see that we have a problem right there, like 1.8 million podcasts, you know, growing like at 60% a year and the listen, the audience growth is not keeping up with it. Well, okay. So yes. And, and there's a story that I tell you and I've talked about this because we were together at PodFest, <laughs> shout out to Chris at PodFest last February before all hell broke loose with COVID. There was a talk, I forget who the speaker was. Maybe it was the guy from Lipson giving a state of the union talk there in the main hall. Yeah, Rob Walsh from Lipson. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there was a chart and the, it was a it was a bar graph and there were two bars on the graph and basically one bar represented the number of podcasts in production or being created over the last, you know, 10, 15 or, you know, 10, 5, 10 years. And uh, the other bar was listeners, you know, the audience. And the bar for the number of podcasts was like a hockey stick. I mean, it just shot off the top of the chart because, of course, it has exploded uh, over the last five years. But the bar for listeners was flat just across the bottom. It's just not growing. It hasn't been. So, it, so it, is, it is growing slowly, for sure, slowly. But, you know, but not in the, not in the same, not no, in the not same, in the same. Not to discourage, not to discourage your audience from, you know, like that's, but this is where the idea of using a search engine, I mean, the, the number, you know, what's the number one way in which people find new podcasts? I don't. Well, word of mouth. I, I would, I would say word of mouth. Most podcast listeners, myself included, would have guessed word of mouth or like, you know, you, if you, if you are a podcast listener, you're probably going to use your app and you're going to look for another show, right? That's what everyone thinks is, is how podcasts, you know, get, get discovered. But, you know, but actually th that's true only for podcast listeners, right? So if you're the rest of the population, you might stumble across it using Google. So Google search, I mean, the Edison research puts, puts these stats out once a year yeah. and, uh, you know, by far, by a long way, way, the number one way people find new podcasts is through Google search. Okay. And that's in part because that's open to the gazillion of people that aren't even podcast listeners yet, right? Or, you know, haven't, or are just exploring or aren't regular listeners. The ability to have some presence and come up in the search results mm -hmm. for what you do on your podcast is super important. You know, like we had one client and he had a dating podcast he started like his show notes started to rank for terms like sexual attraction and so forth. Now there's a lot of people that are searching for dating advice or that are searching through like, and he writes for some big magazine, psychology today and so forth. But you know, the, but the point is, is that they discover he has a show. They discover that there is a podcast to listen to because they searched about this topic that they're interested in on Google, right? It's not that you're limiting yourself to only podcast listeners you know, you're opening yourself up to anyone who's conducting search across the internet. Because you and I know it's like, it's not that easy to do. It's time consuming to prepare, to have guests on and to produce the show. You know, like we, we thought back in the day that this was going to be easier than writing blog posts. Well, we were disabused of that notion pretty quickly. It's, you know, it's not that much, it's not easier. It's, you know, it's, it, it, but it's worth it. It was well, its own unique challenge, isn't it? And when you were talking about searching and Google searches, where are we at in terms of techno search technology being able to 
identify content within a podcast. So in other words, if I'm searching for cannabis strain of the of the year, <laughs> right? <laughs> and there's a lot of there's a lot of podcasts out there, right, that are very much about the cannabis trade and and uh, medical marijuana and so on and so forth. But if if I want to search or, you know, maybe I'm looking for a really cool street artist, uh, you know, in Detroit. Yeah, and and so Google is going to, you know, do what it does to show me results, but is it capable of, or is it able to listen and look into podcasts and serve up like, oh yeah, these three podcasts mentioned that topic at minute 310 or something? Let me answer that question with another question. I mean, the answer, the short, long and short of it is yes, we're getting close. Okay. But here's the more important response to this, you know, with it, it would be to say, what would you, when somebody does that search, what do you want to come up in the search result? Apple, Stitcher, Google, a podcast platform, or do you want to your website to come up in number one? Of course, I want my website to come up as number one. Right. Yeah. right. And so, uh, so the, the tech, I mean, Google has had a project for the last two and a half years that's getting you know, more successful to actually do behind the scenes transcription of all audio content and to serve up the podcast episode in what's called search result snippets. You know, these are the little boxes that you might see in the search results that yeah. actually have a play bar right built into it. But I think they're also honoring the fact that if there is a an episode level page on your website, that they serve that up above. So typically the search results will look like if you look for X num you know, podcast X or for a particular term, cannabis. And if there are some podcast episodes that, you know, that that are the best answer to that question, right? I mean, because Google is just in the business of trying to make our life, you know, our search results more relevant. And so if there's a relevant piece of content that happens to be an episode, they will serve that up, but they will honor that if you happen to have a blog post about it that that are your show notes for that episode, that will live on top. So, you know, ideally what you would want is your own website and then a featured snippet underneath it with a sub snippet of being able to actually play two or three episodes from podcasts that featured that. So I, I like the way that that's, you know, hierarchy is still true because, you know, I would hate to see your website's work that you've done demoted to the lower part of the search results uh, in order for Google to make you go to Google Play or, you know, in order, you know, in order to send you to these platforms that certainly don't need the rank and don't need any more traffic. You as the owner, as the creator, as the, you know, as the content provider, you deserve getting that traffic. And, uh, and I think the, the Google the search results and audio search is still honoring that at this point, at this point in the game. So yeah, we're getting very close. I don't know that all the 1.8 million podcasts and all their episodes have been indexed yet. Right. I think that'll take a long time. Sure. Uh, but you know, increasingly I see the ability to search like within. Uh, but if you, so here's what you need to do. You need to have show notes. You need to have transcripts still on your page. Never mind the fact that Google does that behind the scenes, because what they then present is a complete unreadable block of text in a way. And, you know, you, you want to create an experience for your audience that when they click on the search result and land on your blog, that they're seeing something that's going to keep them there, that's attractive, that's easy to read, that has headings, that has images, that has some quotes in it, that's engaging. Well, it's such an exciting industry and it's, it's changing and evolving so quickly and so fast and, you know, big money is rushing in and it's fascinating to watch. And, you know, I was so inspired and impressed, uh, you know, when, when I attended PodFest uh, in February because it was my first real industry event and to see all of these, you know, individuals so passionate about the subject area, whether it was cooking or fashion or sports or comedy or music or whatever the, the subject matter is, you know, 1.8 million podcasts, there's something out there for everybody. You're a true leader in the industry. For those listeners out there who want to reach out to you at Polymash and engage with you and, and, and hopefully hire you to help them with their podcast, where can they find you, Jurgen, online? 
just polymash.com, P-O-L-Y-M-A-S-H. The name is sort of like, you know, it, it's it's the inability to niche, basically. It's poly is like many, it's a mashup of many things because <laughs> of our checkered journey, right? So, uh, but that that's how we explain Well, and your, your polymash has had a couple of iterations, right? I mean, you started yes. off as an app developer, mm-hmm. you know? Yes, all right. And and we wound up, you know, here being a digital strategy agency and podcasting as content strategy is an area of focus for us because it, you know, it so well dovetails into um, being able to serve people in a whole variety of different, you know, niches. And, um, and I don't know how in the arts, I mean, you've been probably, you've got a greater familiarity and, you know, some of the tools and apps that we've explored together like Podchaser Pro and like tools that would give you insight into what podcasts are available, what is the environment look like for artists and for creatives and for museums and for other types. We've seen so much content in the audio content crop up over the last year. So what's your assessment of podcasts when it comes to art and creative culture of that landscape? Wow, great question. My assessment, well, <laughs> if I'm honest, my assessment is that a lot of it is, is, is poorly done and it's uh, often boring. There's an opportunity, I think, for creative arts podcasts to sex things up a bit, <laughs> to use a technical term, because they, they, they tend to either be, in my, again, my, my opinion, but arts uh, podcasts either tend to be, you know, really serious and precious. Some would call that boring. Well, that doesn't float your boat. It has you to have know sex what I mean? in Yeah, it, yeah. More, it? more TNA, please. <laughs> Some nude portraits, please. No. So there's this bucket of, of serious, precious uh, kinds of maybe, maybe even more academic kinds of, of podcasts. And, and, you know, and that's, you know, one bucket of, of podcasts you find. There is a bucket of podcasts that are geared towards helping artists with their business. So a lot of times, you know, these are companies that that create tools and software solutions for artists to help them sell their work and market their work. Those podcasts tend to be well done. They're very, they're high value. They're educational. They're instructional. They're really trying to provide value to the artist. So, so I think those can be really good and helpful. There are a lot of uh, kind of podcasts that I find that are you're preaching to the choir kind of <laughs> kind of podcast where it's it's you know maybe artists talking to each other. That's and all I, right. Yeah, like you know the yeah, art yeah, no, that, by that's, that, podcast. That's great. I love it. And yeah, you know like, what I find with those podcasts is that from a production value perspective. They can be all over the place. Some are done quite well and some are kind of shoddy. The content's good, but the audio's bad, right? And so, you know, I feel like there's a, a, an opportunity for there to be production improvements, if you will. But, but I feel like there is also this other bucket I, I hope that we kind of fall into, which is what I'll call more of a variety talk show kind of aesthetic where we're talking to, yes, we're talking to artists primarily and maybe even primarily visual artists, but we're also talking to designers and creatives and, and other people who are successful in their creative profession, whether they're a writer or whether they're a programmer or, or what have you. And so I feel like, I mean, for me, just broadly, the reason I'm grateful to be in this space and I'm excited about what it, what, what a lot of people are doing is that arts education has been defunded in the world, you know, around the world. And, you know, I am who I am, as I referenced earlier, I am who I am, because when I went to school, we had a robust tax base that, you know, was able to fund a, a, an amazing arts program. Those programs are gone now. And you're, I don't ever expect that money will come back. So for that 16-year-old kid in Northwest Indiana, like me growing up, you know, what is he or she going to do? Now to get their education, to learn about the arts, to be inspired, to, to be emboldened and empowered. You know, I think podcasting can help to serve those kids in those communities that maybe are hungry for information, hungry for education. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's so interesting that abroad in China and in India, podcasting has more of an educational role. I wouldn't say ahead of the trend in this, but it's just the nature of sort of the self-funded education has been more permeated through those cultures even before. So podcasts there, people pay for them more easily than perhaps here. You know, we when it when podcasting started in 2004 or 5, you know, based on the iPod device and so forth, you know, it was basically music and then talk and then listening and self-publishing. It started such with such small with such a small sort of a footprint. 
that you know now when you're looking at the way that in China and elsewhere their entire education programs that are delivered via podcasts and and via podcasting. I don't want to put you on the spot, but but I think that. You know, I have an idea. Oh, please, let's hear it. I, I need as many you know, good ideas as I can get. Curated list. Let's give ourselves a mission, right? This is an idea for you. When I say you, I mean us, really. I, you know, like it's a curated list of, and you already, you already have a seed of this because in part of your beautiful book that you published earlier in the year, uh, you know, when someone signs up for the 100 of the top street artists, there's a, you know, you produce this amazing visual, visually stunning book. That you and when someone signs up for that, they basically start getting your emails. But one of those is, you know, a curated list of art podcasts that you like. And I think that we ought to make a segment of the website where that curated list lives and where people can discover maybe those categories that you were starting to talk about earlier, right? Are there some entertainment and design podcasts that are fun to listen to? And then, you know, what are the what are some that would be more meaningful for young artists to actually get an art career. There's, there's, you know, art history, educational content. There is, you know, there's, there's so many varieties out there. It always blows my mind, both the quality and the variety of content that can be in still one subcategory, like the arts or creative culture. You know, I'm sure that we would find some really interesting things there. And now having some of the data behind it as well, and being able, to, like I'm talking about Podchaser Pro, and I'm talking about some of the data providers that actually give us insights into the popularity, the spread, and the reach that some of these platforms can have. Um, I think you know having a curated list on your site that people could access will be interesting. I'm sold. You, you've you've sold me. Let's do that. In fact, <laughs> in fact, let's you know let's create a search engine. Let's create a search engine on the website where people can search for uh, based on, I don't know, 11 categories, whether it's performing arts or visual arts or architecture or gaming or what have you, design, arch, you know, music, publishing, what movies. And you want to find a podcast about script writing. You want to find a podcast about architecture. You, you can search on our search engine and boom, you get a list of, of, of the top 10. That uh, sounds awesome to me. And in fact, I'm working on something tangential at the moment, which you love. I've been studying technologies that will, that are compatible with WordPress that create exactly this, a cataloging type of search engine of being able to go through a whole collection of whatever it is, in this case, podcasts, but being able to present them and sort them and filter them and lay them out and basically, you know, to basically sort of become a search engine. There is a way in which we could build that right now. And it would just mean knowing which ones to put in and how to do the categorization is not a small feat either. But I think still, even if you started small with like, you know, the top 50 art and design podcasts in the world, according to, you know, curated by Scott Power, I think I would certainly sign up. <laughs> then let's do that because that I think would be a great service because the reality is, in my experience anyway, what, what I find is that there are some wonderful, high value podcasts out there. But the problem is they're not curated. They're not merchandised in a way that makes it easy to find. Discoverability is an issue. We're drowning in content. Finding something that might be very relevant or meaningful it can be very challenging. So to be able to create a destination, a trusted destination for people to go to and go like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, a really cool podcast on UX design. Let me go to notrealart.com and, and search for that because they're going to give me the top 10 or what have you. I mean, it's, it's, I, I think that's, you know, that's where it's all going, going, it has to go there. It has to get smarter. Discoverability has to become easier. We've just been producing, producing, producing. Now it's time to organize the chaos and, and I feel like doing it around certain verticals, our vertical being the creative arts, so to speak, is a great place to start. Yeah. And I mean, and you've, you too, you've, you know, put so much effort also into building the Not Real Art School, right? I mean, school.notrealart.com is an amazing platform of courses for young and up and coming artists to learn the business of art. And I think it belongs there too, right? Like why not have, I mean, whether it's a course or a free resource, but, you know, having a collection of being able to get an education, auditorily speaking, 
um, you know, while you're working or, you know, something to listen to that will further your business knowledge savvy or understanding of art history or whatnot. I mean, I think that, you know, it could live in that environment, in that context as well. I think it'd be, you're already providing an awesome service. You know, I think doing that additional work would uh, be awesome. Well, thank you for that, and and that's a great idea, and and, and let's uh, put that on our to on our to do list, our ever growing to do list, to-do list. Um, which you know <laughs> is job security for you, no doubt. I am so grateful, Jurgen, not just to call you my partner and my colleague, but my friend. You and I have become good friends. I think uh, over the last couple of years, we've found a, a nice rapport, Absolutely. and uh, you, you know, and of course, your your lovely bride, uh, Robin. How is Robin these days? How's her business? Uh, tell our listeners uh, about her expertise. Oh, she is known as the positivity strategist. And so, um, you know, I'm very extremely bad. And, and you know what? We've been both working on Polymash in, you know, in the last sort of like half year because it's gotten very, it's got, gotten very business, busy. She also had, I mean, she was sort of a guinea pig in our journey towards podcasting. And her show is called The Positivity Strategist. And has had five seasons of that. And she's continuously getting, and some of them sponsored, right? These are, you know, not that this is a way of making money and there was never a monetization expectation, you know, behind it. But what the underlying philosophy for, and, and I'm the beneficiary of that. And Positivity Strategist is about a organizational development methodology called Appreciative Inquiry, which is basically building on existing strengths in organizations or communities or families or even in personal development areas. So that is what her show has been about is, you know, not focus. I mean, it's like her very first episode or one of the first episodes was what you focus on grows. And so if you focus on the bad and, you know, and if you focus on things that have a negative connotation, you know, it's just going to grow more and more. Um, and so she helped organizations. I mean, she worked, she did this at Google. She did this at like Deutsche Bank. Like, you know, we, we used to have, when I worked, uh, when I worked there, we used to have these software reviews that were called postmortems, you know, like, and everyone would be hating that idea, you know, like, and to be in there on a Monday morning and think about all the things that went wrong with the software release, you know? And so many organizations do that, right? But like, if you're working for an airline, for example, and you came in and it wasn't about lost bag- customer baggage complaints, but that meeting was entitled optimizing passenger arrival experience, right? Like everyone would enter the room with a completely different expectation. And that's what she uh, is an expert in. And, uh, and that's still what she's very much in demand. And she like, you know, gets requests to, have people on her show and get invited and basically speak on that, uh, speak on that. She's been on Ted and things like that. So I'm, I'm very fortunate, you know, it's just like, it's not my natural disposition. You know, I'm, I'm more like of a skeptic at heart, but I've, by osmosis, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm continuing. Well, it's, it's a yin yang <laughs> thing, right? It's good to have that balance. Channing and you must have the same sort of thing, you know, aspects of your lives, right? Where you, Augment each other. Yeah, the the way I describe my dynamic uh, with my wife is yum and yuck. Guess who is yum? (laughs) (laughs) It's like it ain't me. I can tell you that. And uh, yeah, yes, opposites attract sometimes and are necessary actually to strike that balance. Uh, God knows I couldn't be married to somebody like me, not for very long anyway. Last photography quote is is from from my old you know from one of my old influences is like the thing is what it is only in relation to what it is not. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So we couldn't exist without that juxtaposition. That's a very good place, I think, to wrap this up because that's a it's, it's a nice thinker. It's a, it's a thoughtful uh, notion here. Jürgen Bercussel, I'm so, again, so grateful that you took time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Will you do, do, this, the, do us the honor and come back? Absolutely. And, you know, like this, thank you so much, first of all. Like, you know, I think I, I value our friendship first and foremost. And the fact that we're getting to collaborate, you know, it's, it's on, on some meaningful missions that you bring to the world. We're honored to be part of that journey. Well, thank you for that, my friend, Jürgen. You have a, a fantastic day. It's five o'clock your time. Is it, is it Miller time? Are you going to crack a, a, a delicious German beer? <laughs> what, what are you doing right now? Not much of a beer drink, I have to admit, but you know, like now we're, we're, we're getting ready to do the sort of traditional Christmas shopping 
uh, for German delicacies and my mom coming over and all nice. of that. Right? So like, you know, yes. I'm sure you're getting ready for the holiday with kids and family as well. And um, Indeed we are. Indeed. Well, to that point, my friend, happy holidays. You have a fantastic night. Cheers. Happy holidays to you. And thank you. Cheers. Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. Please be sure to like this episode, write a review, and share with your friends on social. And if you haven't already done so, please press the subscribe button and follow us on Instagram at Not Real Art World. If you're an artist, be sure to apply for our 2021 artist grant at notrealart.com. Sourdough, out. 